Um, in Proof of Heaven, a neurosurgeon's journey into the afterlife, you describe your unexpected total change of understanding of how the universe works that happened after being in a coma and having a near-death experience. And I'm wondering what you would distill for people about how they can apply what you learn to their lives. What, what, what can we learn for those of us who haven't had an NDE? I mean, well, I think the main thing to learn, uh, I mean, what my NDE was, and this is, you know, my interpretation, and it's one that's shared among many uh, neuroscientists around the world who are aware of my illness and, and what happened there. Uh, but the biggest lesson of it all is that our conscious awareness, uh, not only is it not created by the physical brain, um, but it's, uh, it's just allowed in and filtered in many ways by the physical brain, right, which has tremendous implications. And of course, this also dovetails into uh, much of the work in, in uh, some of the deepest questions in modern science having to do with the nature of consciousness, relationship of brain and mind, uh, and especially uh, things like the measurement paradox in quantum physics, which have been extraordinarily challenging to understand. And yet, uh, the, they're all linked together, and that has to do uh, with the fact that we, we basically have made some assumptions, uh, especially in the scientific revolution over the last 400 years, that just weren't true. Uh, and until we started to examine very closely brain, mind, and consciousness, we couldn't tell that, uh, you know, our underlying assumptions uh, were very misleading and, and false. I mean, they failed to explain a tremendous amount of human experience. So I think what, uh, what your listeners should rejoice in is the fact that this um, turn of events and this very extraordinary uh, uh, shift of the tide in our understanding of the nature of reality from a scientific perspective uh, is what is truly shifting here. And it's, uh, it's gigantic. And it, uh, it opens up the possibilities not only for the reality of the afterlife uh, by demonstrating very clearly that the brain is not the creator of consciousness as much as a filter that allows uh, conscious states to manifest. Um, and, and I think this is where it really gets extraordinary because not only uh, do we support so many uh, near-death experiences, after-death communications, uh, psychic medium uh, communications with souls of departed loved ones, etc., but we start to get uh, some reasonable way of explaining things like uh, the extraordinary scientific evidence for reincarnation. Uh, if you look at the work of Ian Stevenson and Jim Tucker, more than six decades of very hardcore scientific work at the University of Virginia, uh, and basically, anyone who's interested should go to uvadops.org uh, and look at a lot of the information on their website. Uh, but they, in a nutshell, they've uncovered more than 2,700 cases of past life memories in children, suggestive uh, of reincarnation, very strongly so. And in fact, when you realize how powerful that huge body of evidence is, to simply deny it is impossible because our current theoretical models don't explain it uh, is, is ridiculous, especially when you realize our current um, explanatory models uh, don't tell us anything about the fundamental nature of consciousness. I mean, the, the world of neuroscience uh, is about as far from any notion of a deep understanding of consciousness uh, as we've ever been, and we're just coming to recognize that. I think my near-death experience in many ways is a very direct refutation and rebuttal of the simplistic and false um, paradigm of materialism or physicalism, that the physical world is all that exists. You know, and if my NDE were the only one out there, I don't think anybody would pay it much mind, but the fact is it's one of millions of NDEs, and when you study them in detail, you find they have tremendous similarities. They suggest very strongly that they are referring to a realm that's more real than this one, uh, and this is where it gets very exciting. So when you realize that uh, current uh, scientific study of consciousness involves uh, various uh, systems, as we explain in our book, Living in a Mindful Universe. We explore this uh, very deeply about the, uh, the fact that uh, idealism, the, the mental universe, appears to be the best model to explain so much of what happens uh, in reality. 
And that's where I think uh, your listeners can find a great solace and refuge, because what it really does in many ways is it returns free will into, uh, you know, human uh, activities, because the material model that I had worshipped before my coma, you know, brain creates consciousness, that only the physical exists, basically denies there's any such thing as free will, because it just pretends that all the workings of consciousness and phenomenal human experience uh, are nothing more than the confusing epiphenomenon of the uh, chemical reactions and electron fluxes in the physical substance of the brain. And that is simply not true. But that materialist paradigm very quickly stomps on any notion you might have a free will and that humans have anything to do with uh, determining the course of events uh, that occur in this uh, four-dimensional space-time reality. And I think that is absolutely false. I think free will is alive and well. That's something we explore deeply in our book, Living in a Mindful Universe. Um, but really it has, has to do with acknowledging that our choices matter and that we have responsibility. Because that materialist science would try and pretend, well, it's just chemical reactions, electron fluxes, uh, given that they can't see any way to work free will into that equation. Uh, you know, obviously we have no responsibility for any choice we ever make if it's just these chemical reactions following the laws of physics and chemistry and biology. But that is not the picture that's coming into the modern scientific interpretation of the understanding of consciousness and the nature of reality. And so the flip side of the coin of this deep understanding and this great liberation is that we are responsible for our choices. We will reap what we sow. Uh, and uh, that's why the mindful universe is very important. It's very mindful of every bit of what we do. And in fact, you really can't separate our kind of conscious awareness from the self-awareness of the universe at large. Uh, and that's where all this, I believe, gets to be very, very exciting and liberating for the individual seeker who wants to do some good for this world. A lot of people who have NDEs go through a review of their life to see, oh, I could have done that better. I should have made a different choice. This is the consequences of my action. You didn't experience that because you lost all your memory. So um, right. how, how does that personally play out in your understanding of how we're, we're responsible for our decisions? Well, my amnesia was a very kind of interesting facet of my NDE, as you have pointed out. Uh, and it took me uh, uh, many months, if not a year or more, to even begin to glimpse why that was important and why that atypical feature was there. I believe all NDEs, when you study them en masse, uh, they have tremendous similarities, and they truly do suggest a very real realm that is there. But the other thing to remember is that NDEs are always tailored for the individual soul and the journey. So uh, for me, uh, as a neurosurgeon with an interest in brain, mind, and consciousness, and in kind of the fundamental workings of physics in the universe, this NDE suited perfectly, but it did involve some very dramatic uh, shifts. I mean, I had to lose all of my memories, everything. No words, no language, no knowledge of Evan Alexander's life. I uh, didn't even recognize loved ones at the bedside when I came back to this world. Uh, so that amnesia was very important. But in the midst of the journey, I saw in kind of a generic fashion how vast civilizations, even far more advanced than ours, go through this similar process of sentient beings incarnating in the physical realm with a temporary kind of dumbing down and forgetting uh, of information. That's why we don't all have the information available to our higher souls through our whole life here, but it gets kind of erased, deleted, covered up. That's what those people who study um, past life memories in children realize is by age six, so many of those memories are disappearing very actively because there is a an active process of suppression that actively gives us skin in the game to live these lives. And I could see in my journey, even though I had no personal knowledge of Evan Alexander's life and was being showing these extraordinary kind of features and workings of the universe, uh, the life review, it, I remember the way it was presented to me in this very generic sense, because given that I had no memory of Evan Alexander's life, I was not in a situation where I could go through a life review of Evan Alexander's life. Uh, and that's why things were presented differently to me. But 
uh, the generic presentation of life review of your life flashing before your eyes. It's that kind of mid-course correction to help in this uh, broad process of reincarnation, all of the, the infinitude of, uh, of, of incarnations of sentient beings coming into this realm and then out of this realm, into this realm, out of this realm. I saw it as uh, uh, interwoven threads in this master tapestry of, uh, of reincarnations. I saw it um, in the core realm as these uh, beautiful uh, kind of demonstration of flying fish that would be in and out of the water representing our being down here in the murky kind of depths of very dense four-dimensional space-time, but then being liberated when we're freed from the shackles of the, of the physical brain into like just an extraordinary experience to go through and yet uh given the fact i had to lose all my memories and then regain them all in better fashion than they had been before showed me a tremendous amount about memory but that took months and even years to unfold that kind of knowledge it doesn't just come with the nde itself the nde is like this incredible explosion of of uh, of information to kind of reframe the world view that's why ndes can be so shocking and mine was absolutely Absolutely that. And here I am 10 years out from waking up from that coma, and I'm still deeply mired in the beautiful process of trying to unravel it, come to some understanding of it. Uh, and that's why I feel that even living in a mindful universe probably will not be our final book on this one, because there is so much going on. And I've, I've come to realize that my journey as a scientist, as a neuroscientist, very interested in understanding the nature of reality and relationship between brain and mind, um, parallels the journey of the modern scientific community. In fact, in many ways, you could say it parallels a few thousand years of human evolution and thinking on this. Uh, because in so many ways, what I've come to realize is some of the deepest truths that we are approaching now through the measurement paradox in quantum physics and the hard problem of consciousness and all of the evidence around us for non-local consciousness, that is that we can know things beyond the kin of our physical senses, all of this is driving us to a much more uh, kind of refreshing and liberating worldview of humanity and why we're all here and what this is about and where we're headed. And I would say the NDE community does a tremendous amount to remind us that at the very core of all of this is a very infinitely loving force, the creative source of all that happens that is intimately related with our very conscious awareness. We are not separate from that creative force. And that's where this notion of free will of the higher soul starts to take on tremendous power at bringing this world back into alignment. Uh, you know, what we came here to do, uh, the current picture of humanity of me is an embarrassment of, of just horribly kind of immature and... Uh, um, basically kind of a clueless existence in many ways. So we've kind of painted ourselves into a corner, but I think there are many, many positive signs that we're headed out of that crazy morass, that false sense of separation uh, that came when, when we had the divorce between uh, scientific and technological capabilities in the 20th and early 21st century and the, the deeper essence of human spirit that can see the bigger picture and try to come to a meaningful uh, kind of vision of who we are, why we're here, where all this is headed, and how we can insert our free will to try and uh, optimize this situation for all life throughout the universe. Could you <clears throat> say a word about the quantum measurement problem and the hard problem of consciousness, kind of define those for us? Well, yeah, and I, would, I also want to define another word. It's called consilience. Uh, this is a term often used in science and history, philosophy. Uh, consilience simply means when you look at a big, deep, profound problem from different perspectives, when you start finding that there's radically different ways of looking at it uh, tend to align in where they're steering you, that is consilience. And I would say we have a very profound form of consilience now uh, with two of the deepest and most profound mysteries known to modern science. One of them is the measurement paradox in quantum physics and uh, what's called contextuality, which is the fact that you can demonstrate uh, very clearly in quantum experiments that the mind of the observer and conscious choices of that mind have a tremendous uh, uh, kind of black and white impact 
on how uh, the experiment uh, evolves and the kind of information that comes out of it. Uh, to the point that uh, John Wheeler, who was one of the most renowned quantum physicists of the 20th century, uh, head of physics at uh, Princeton University through uh, much of the mid and late part of that century, came up with what he called the, uh, uh, the sorry, I'm blocking, it's the anthropic principle, the, uh, um, sorry, I'm blocking on this, uh, participatory anthropic principle, I'm sorry, there it is. Uh, but it has to do with the fact that we participate in the evolving reality, even to the point where in one of his thought experiments that concerned a photon coming from a very dif distant uh, quasar uh, and then using an intervening galaxy as a, 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 a gravitational lens, that this photon that left its quasar billion, billions of years ago actually is affected all the way back to its origin based on the mindful decision of an astronomer about how to observe that photon. And when you follow all of this deeply in the modern scientific world, what you'll find is it's an astonishing paradox. And just as the founding fathers of quantum physics, like Wolfgang Pauli and Erwin uh, Schrodinger and others, argued that consciousness is fundamental, uh, because that's what the experiments of quantum physics suggested to them, um, we're finding now that uh, it's really the only way out is to uh, look at idealism, as we explain in our book, Living in a Mindful Universe, metaphysical idealism, that the universe is um, mental primarily. There's a top-down causation uh, of, of this mental universe. And that's what we're really discovering. So that's within the world of quantum physics where you're finding primacy of consciousness. Well, likewise, if you go into the hard problem of consciousness, which is something that was rigorously defined by the Australian philosopher uh, David Chalmers in his beautiful book, The Conscious Mind, back in 1996, uh, it points out a very serious set of explanatory gaps in trying to pretend that the uh, physical brain gives rise to the conscious mind and just pretend that's the end of the story. And there are numerous lines of evidence. I don't have time to go into all of them now, but the hard problem of consciousness, if you Google that term, you'll find out exactly what I mean. And those problems have already got, have just gotten much worse, uh, you know, in the 15, uh, 20 years or so since uh, that was first described, even though they've been working towards a knowing of the hard problem of consciousness for decades. Uh, the work of John Searle, the work of uh, Thomas Nagel and other philosophers interested in the mind-body uh, question, uh, they were hot on the trail to realizing it wasn't adding up that you could explain it all from materialism. Uh, in fact, the Wilder Penfield, one of the most renowned neurosurgeons of the 20th century, back in 1975, wrote a book called The Mystery of the Mind, based on his very intensive scientific investigation with electrical stimulation of the brain in awake patients. And he wrote that book after several decades of hardcore scientific world work proved to him that the brain cannot be the producer of consciousness. He even thought for a long time that the brain was the site of memory storage, but the more he tried to find it, the more he realized it's not in the brain. Uh, at the end of the day, towards, you know, 1975, he said, well, maybe memories can be stored somewhere in the, in the brainstem, but they're not being stored in the neocortex. He was quite convinced of that. Um, and I would say modern evidence confirms very clearly what he surmised. Memory is not stored in the brain at all. That is such a death knell, uh, nail in the coffin of the materialist model in neuroscience that people don't don't talk about it. And yet neurosurgeons have suspected for a long time, given that never has there been a case where we resected some part of neocortex in somebody's brain or some other part of the brain uh, and actually had a definable loss of, of you know, a swathe of memories. It doesn't happen. Uh, it is true that if you uh, uh, damage a neurosurgeon, surgically damaged medial temporal lobe, the hippocampus, interrhinal cortex, structures like that. Yes, you can uh, interfere with the conversion of short-term to long-term memory, but that's not the same as getting rid of the locus of memory storage. It's not even stored in the brain. And this is something we cover in great detail, living in a mindful universe, not only how consciousness is not created by the brain, but memories are not stored there. And of course, when you realize all that hardcore scientific evidence for reincarnation, 2,700 cases, and in 35% of those cases, the children actually have a physical birthmark that corresponds with the lethal wound of a prior incarnation. I mean, that body of evidence is extremely powerful. 
Uh, I often say that you can, I don't believe you can ever fully answer the question of, of the afterlife and near-death experiences alone because those people don't die, they come back. It's still a big shocker that many millions and millions of people have these kind of extraordinary experiences uh, of NDEs that really have no explanation uh, in Western medicine. Uh, so we must pay attention to that. But the only way to come up with the big picture what this all means about the nature of reality and understanding consciousness, we need to look at all manner of non-local consciousness. And that includes things like past life memories in children, uh, indicative of reincarnation. And once you realize reincarnation is part of our existence, obviously you're no longer trying to pretend that memories are stored in the physical brain. Mm -hmm. um, do you think it's just typical for human nature that when a paradigm shifts that there's tremendous opposition and you get put in jail or burned at the stake or whatever or do you think there's even more opposition to the new paradigm of idealism now because it seems woo-woo well i think um one of the problems is we're we're dealing with some very tough tough and uh, very deep challenges here. You know, the relationship of brain and mind, nature of consciousness. Well, given that no human being has ever experienced anything other than the inside of their own consciousness, it's very difficult to kind of get outside and get any kind of perspective to help us understand it more deeply. That's why I'm a tremendous fan of meditation. I find that going within is actually a way of traversing that veil and getting out into that universal consciousness, that connecting force of universal mind. And that's where I believe we can get a lot of, uh, of fascinating insights. That's why I meditate an hour or two a day. I use sacred acoustics. I highly recommend uh, anybody who wants to get into meditation but doesn't yet have a very strong and powerful practice, uh, try out Sacred Acoustics. Go to sacredacoustics.com and download uh, Karen's free 20-minute uh, uh, OM file and start working with her instructional videos. You'll find uh, this can be an extremely exciting adventure. Uh, now, it turns out uh, Thomas Kuhn wrote that beautiful book about uh, paradigm shifts and the anatomy of, uh, of scientific revolutions back in the uh, mid 20th century and I think he made a lot of tremendously important points uh, and and they're very applicable to this paradigm shift that we are seeing even now um, it turns out uh, just as we've spent the last 80 plus years circling the drain trying to understand the measurement paradox in quantum physics so none of this is going to be simple and a pushover in terms of understanding you really need to broaden the mindset, and that's what I think is going on now. Now, of course, Max Planck is famous for having said that the way these scientific revolutions occur is one funeral at a time. I'm not quite that pessimistic about it because I believe that the evidence is there. All you really have to do is pay attention to the evidence. Uh, to the scientific members of the crowd, I would recommend the books of Ed Kelly from University of Virginia, Division of Perceptual Studies. Uh, to anyone, go to their website, uvadops.org, you'll learn a tremendous amount more. But those scientific books include Irreducible Mind, Toward a Psychology for the 21st Century, uh, and of course the book they put out in 2015 that's more of a theoretical basis, but uh, just an incredibly powerful book showing the way this revolution is going, uh, is uh, Beyond Physicalism, Toward a Reconciliation of Science and Spirituality. Again, Ed Kelly, uh, a group out of UVA and out of the Esalen uh, group in California were the ones who put together those two very profound books. Uh, you really can't start to understand this unless you're studying consciousness itself and human experience. Uh, I always thought uh, through much of my life that physics is the pathway to answer. Well, physics is a pathway to answer about a lot of things that happen in the physical world. But when you start running into situations like most physicists explaining the measurement paradox by simply saying all you need is infinite parallel universe, Versus, and you can, you know, the Hugh Everett uh, 1957 Many Worlds interpretation of quantum physics, and then they can just kind of brush their hands of the matter and walk away and never discuss consciousness. But how do any of us make sense of infinite parallel universes, and how do they live their lives differently because of these infinite parallel universes? I'm not sure, but what I can tell you is a different way of solving that problem is idealism, is realizing that mind is primarily responsible for everything that happens in this universe, and it returns free will right where it belongs, also starts to give us tremendous power. Now, mind over matter is not a new concept. Uh, in medicine, 
since then, I mean, for more than 60 years now, we've looked at placebo, placebo. effect as this extraordinary uh, kind of reality of, of everything, which is the patient who believes they are doing something to get better can get better. And this is not just about a headache, hip pain, back pain, things like that. There are cases, uh, if you go to the Noetic Sciences website, Site, look at the book that they put together in the mid-1990s on spontaneous regression and healing. You'll find more than 3,500 cases of extraordinary healing, often because patients just believe that they can get better. And this spontaneous reveals Spontaneous like, remission, right? You said regression. Right, spontaneous being, remission remission. And, and spontaneous regression of tumors, infections, things like that. Ah. Uh, and it's a beautiful example of, of mind over matter. I mean, placebo effect is just a rich, rich example of mind over matter. And if you don't believe it's real, ask Big Pharma. They can't stand it <laughs> because they realize they've got to overcome about a 30% beneficial uh, effect that happens when a patient believes they can get better. Uh, and, and, and it just shows that our uh, materialist science is taught in medical school and nursing school and molecular medicine. Um, all of that is very outmoded. There's a tremendous amount of power of will uh, that has an influence in healing, and any and every one of us can take advantage of that knowledge by expanding our beliefs. My favorite example is people who have a disassociative identity disorder. One alter will have diabetes and the other won't. One will wear glasses and the other not need them. I, I mean, that's huge. Right. It, it, it is really kind of astonishing. And, and interesting, you point out that whole, whole dissociation phenomenon, uh, you know, multiple personalities, as many people know that, um, because that is a model that is coming recently uh, into uh, the kind of world of bigger consciousness studies to help us understand why we all seem to be separate from each other and separate from that God force, that uh, infinite uh, all-loving consciousness that seems to be governing the unfolding of events in this universe. And um, so the whole idea of dissociation and personalities, I think that was first a point made by John Climo, uh, who is uh, renowned in kind of the UFO and uh, uh, that world, but he's also a very uh, uh, renowned uh, psychologist, parapsychologist, who's done a tremendous amount of work on these lines. Uh, I know Bernardo Castrup has recently written several very uh, um, illustrative uh, articles concerning dissociation uh, in that sense and how it might explain much of this world that we inhabit. Uh, and I think that Bernardo is uh, very much on target in many ways. He's been a strong collaborator uh, of some of our work and certainly an endorser of living in a mindful universe. Um, it's, uh, it's, it's fascinating, but uh, I always thought that, that physics was going to be the answer to everything about uh, the nature of reality, but I just didn't realize how much we are fooled into believing that that reality out there exists out there as some kind of reality independent of mind. And yet none of it has ever existed independently of mind. There's a whole top-down ordering of causality in this universe that has to do with the mental uh, qualities of the universe. Because we have free will, we humans are really destroying the planet and inequality is growing, not, not decreasing. You know, what is this, like 38 billionaires own as much as half the world's population. So I'm, I'm wondering in, in, the, in terms of your worldview, do you feel there's hope for us or that maybe something else like, will evolve that's higher? Uh, than I feel there's tremendous hope for us. That hope depends very heavily on eradicating that false notion of separation that is so much a cornerstone of materialist science. I mean, materialist science is known as reductive materialism. You break everything down into its parts, you understand the relationships between those parts, and then somehow you can explain how everything works. I don't believe human lives and all the events in our lives uh, can be broken down that simply at all. And in fact, I believe there are far more powerful top-down causal influences. Uh, and that's where all of this gets to be uh, quite a bit more interesting. But uh, I'm very optimistic. But it has to do with a reversal. We can't continue believing that materialist science and its preaching of a false sense of separation is the way the world actually is. Uh, the, the way that modern consciousness studies are evolving is the notion of one mind, 
people want to learn more about that, I steer you to Dr. Yeah, Larry yes. Dosky's beautiful book by the same title, One Mind. Uh, he makes an excellent case for the fact that we really seem to be dealing with one mind overall, something Erwin Schrodinger wrote a beautiful essay about uh, more than half a century ago. Um, and I think that once we start to acknowledge that, and of course, near-death experiences uh, uh, point out very clearly that the golden rule, treat others as you would like to be treated, uh, is written into the very fabric of the universe in the form of the life review that so many people have gone through over the last 2,400 years plus. That life review, you experience your, the effect of your actions and thoughts on others, but you don't experience it as yourself. You experience it as the victim, you know, as the person who is the subject of your actions, your thoughts, your words. Of course, if you treated everybody beautifully and lovingly, that also is reflect, reflected in the life uh, you know, the more we realize that the scientific study of NDEs is proving that they have a very real basis in this universe, uh, the more we should realize you need to be careful about how you treat yourself and others. Treat all with love, respect, kindness, uh, acceptance, mercy, and when necessary, forgiveness. And the more we can live by those principles, the easier time we'll have when that life review comes up and in uh, you know, planning the stepping stones for that uh, next incarnation. Mm -hmm. um, last question is, what's your next book going to offer that you wasn't in the previous three books? Well, I think the main thing is I still need a much firmer connection uh, between brain and phenomenal experience, phenomenological experience. We, we outline a general uh, kind of picture of that in Living in a Mindful Universe that I think is the way forward. And it is uh, consistent uh, with many of the other uh, kind of scientists who uh, are pursuing a much richer uh, version of the nature of consciousness and nature of reality. But uh, there's no question we ha still have a tremendous amount of work to do in understanding how that uh, ontological or metaphysical idealism works. How, how is it that uh, we can uh, align with that the mind of the universe, which is actually the source of our very conscious awareness, but how can we reduce this kind of veiling and filtering between us and much more clearly see the information that's presented to us uh, from those realms and also act on it. Uh, use that free will of the higher soul in ways uh, to cause the changes in this world that will bring the peace and harmony uh, and prosperity that I believe is promised uh, by this extraordinary vision as we uh, awaken. But it definitely involves uh, you know, acknowledgement of the one mind is also an acknowledgement that you don't, shouldn't have a, a tiny minority of people with the power to control everybody else. Uh, so this is going to be a very liberating, uh, refreshing process for all involved, even those who uh, would be dethroned from that uh, kind of highest level of activity because they are not aiming this world in a direction that's going to be very good for them. The kind of greed and, and uh, uh, concentration of resources in very, very tight corners, especially when they have uh, their own hidden agendas and those agendas work against us. And that includes a lot of corporate greed and a lot of the destruction to the planet that you pointed out earlier. Uh, all of that is going to have to uh, reverse uh, because that is taking us uh, straight to our demise, uh, that kind of insane insane, reckless, wanton, greedy, selfish um, approach to life um, is, is not the way forward. And uh, there is a beautiful way forward that uh, enables people to uh, flaunt their, their, their gifts and their attributes to make the world a better place and can reward them for that. But we need to stop rewarding the people who are just destroying the world outright. Uh, some of the uh, corporate greed with a very damaging, uh, you know, the pollution uh, with plastics, uh, burning fossil fuels. I mean, there's a whole litany of, of changes that need to happen that have come out of this kind of senseless greed uh, and, and kind of lack of uh, mindfulness about the consequences of actions. So it's time for us to take responsibility for our actions, for the political leaders and corporate leaders to step up to the plate, go for the higher ground, the common good, the higher human good for all involved, which can always be worked into the equation. 
situation. And that's why I'm so optimistic that I believe that this shift in understanding of the nature of consciousness as it filters into the rest of the world will help us all to make more choices out of love, compassion, forgiveness, acceptance, and mercy. Uh, and all of that will lead to a far more peaceful and harmonious planet. That's a beautiful place to end. Um